Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Masters of the Illustrated Film Poster. Give it up, everybody! Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I am your moderator today. My name is Steven Kramer Glickman. Uh, I uh, am hosting this, uh, this panel because I love illustrated film posters. They're all over my home. I've been a fan of these guys for a very, very long time. And I'm uh, the host of the Nighttime Show podcast, which I believe is the only podcast that has a different illustrated poster uh, hand-painted every month uh, for the last uh, four years. So, uh, so I, I am a true supporter of these wonderful men. Uh, I'm going to do some introductions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have Steve Chorney here, best known for his work uh, on the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood poster, which is out right now, uh, about to come out. Roger Rabbit, and of course, the Labyrinth poster. Give it up for Steve Chorney, everyone. You gotta love this guy. If you love scary stuff, this is your guy. Uh, you, you've seen his work, his posters, Evil Dead, Two for Evil Dead 2, uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and of course, Rocky IV and The Terminator, Jason Edmiston, everyone. Uh, then uh, you'll be over to his left, uh, just a little over there, we've got, we've got a wonderful guy. Uh, his work uh, includes one of my favorite movies I've seen in the last few years, Deadpool 2. Uh, Alita, Battle Angel, and Book of Henry, James Goodridge, everyone. You gotta love this. Uh, th this fella did, uh, he's uh, now, uh, you guys might know him from the, from the Kurtz Hurts. Uh, this guy is incredible. Um, his, uh, his posters for Baby Driver, uh, the, the TV show Good Omens, which I just finished watching, which I love, and of course, I, Tanya. Give it up for Rory Kurtz, everyone! Kurt Kurtz, thank you. You've loved his posters for a long time, folks. Uh, he did Robin Hood with Errol Flynn, uh, City Slickers 2, and Jewel of the Nile. Robert Rodriguez, everyone! I have a feeling you wouldn't be at Comic-Con if you weren't a fan of the uh, film poster for Doctor Strange. Uh, Star Wars, The Last Jedi, and of course, a little tiny movie called Avengers Infinity War. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Shipper! All the way in. Uh, this, this next person has done some incredible work that I'm a massive fan of. She did It Follows, uh, Funny Games, and the one I love, I Akiko Sterenberger, everyone. Of course, an absolute classic. His stuff is incredible. You've uh, you've seen his posters your entire lives. I mean, Rock and Roll High School. Are you kidding me? And Life of Brian William Stout. Everyone. If you are in this room, uh, you most likely got one of these booklets, and they're so cool. They're just for you guys, and they're in the back, which is really neat. Is all the posters that didn't make it. Uh, so you gotta look at those, they're so cool. Um, guys, thanks so much for being here. Give them a big round of applause for being here. Uh, okay, so our first, first question uh, for you is, uh, and this, anyone feel free to answer on this, what is it about the art of illustrated film posters that means something to you? Why does it mean something to you? I'll start that off. Please. We get paid to do that, so it's very important. <laughs> but I love doing that. I've always loved it. I want to be an artist. It didn't matter I did movie posters, but it worked out that way, and I'm very glad it did. That's 
just what I have to say. Were you inspired? Was there artwork that you saw that made you want to get into that business, to, to do that? Have you ever seen anything that was inspiring as a kid? Not so much as a kid. I didn't go to the movies as a kid very much, but when I was gainfully employed as an artist, I was in the animation field, and a movie came out that John Alvin had done the poster for, and I looked at that, it was for Blazing Saddles. Mm -hmm. I looked at that and I thought, I should be doing this sort of thing. So it moved in that direction. I also had the opportunity, and it was really a good one, uh, to be able to work in the early years with uh, Drew Struzan. Yeah. And by the way, it should be noted, we asked him to be here with us, but unfortunately he wasn't able to, so you should know that. But anyway, I, I, who better to be able to work with and, and get a little bit of sense of how to, how to work. And so that's uh, where I began working along with, with him. Uh, what about the rest of you? Where, where did you start and why, uh, why does it mean so much to you, the, you know, the artwork? Why does it mean so much? Do I have to press the button or anything? No. Oh, okay. Um, I think I'm purely speaking for myself, and it's interesting that Steve would mention Drew's work is that I can remember as a kid coming across his album covers um, and there was a store in the UK, it was basically a newsagent's bookstore with a little record department and I can have only been, I don't know, maybe eight or nine and I remember every time I would go in there I would grab the Alice Cooper's Greatest Hits album cover and it was just, there was something that drew me, I had no idea what the music was but every time I would see that cover it would make me incredibly happy and uh, strangely enough then, well not strangely enough, coincidentally, a couple of years later, went to see Star Wars, and I saw this other painting that he did with Charlie White III. And again, I wasn't looking at the names of the people who had done this work, I was just interested in, in images that moved me. And so there's a real thread, I find, going through when I look back, and maybe it feels more like a thread when you look back than when you're on the journey. But where I look back and sort of realize that at little points throughout your life, it was in some way not directing you, but it was pulling you and saying, this means something. This, this grabs at your heart in the way that not all art does and photography can, but seldom can do quite what illustration, whether it's digital, whether it's watercolor, oils, whatever your medium, there's something about the human touch which communicates from you. Richard M. Zell was also someone who was fantastic. Mm -hmm. He was a little, a little short of group, I think. Um, and uh, and J.C. Leyendecker, who really, really uh, influenced on everybody, you know. Uh, when the, the very first Leyendecker book came out, all of a sudden there were about 20 different artists across the country painting like Leyendecker, myself included. Mm -hmm. But uh, those were uh, not necessarily just movie stuff, but all that stuff goes together to making that. And that's always something that's influenced me. Yeah, for me, it, it combined three of my big passions. One was art, making art. The other is uh, movies. I'm a huge movie fan. And the third thing was money. <laughs> was, uh, movie posters and, and uh, uh, corporate of uh, annuals uh, made the most money for illustrators back in the 1970s. So that, that was really appealing. So in which order was it? Which order? In which order? Oh, art first. Okay. There's a spot good. for you to go down there. Movie second. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, say that again. There's a spot for you guys to leave them. I'll chime in. Or if um, you have to wear For me, the uh, like art was always the leading in there, you have to, like, force in my life. I was four years old and I knew I wanted to be an artist, whatever that was, uh, for a living, I guess, you know, when I grew up. And as a, as a young kid, I was always into comic books, that was my gateway drug. So, you know, Garfield and then, uh, you know, cut strip comics and, and ultimately comic books. And a lot of the artists that I would see in Mad Magazine and, uh, you know, doing covers or, or illustrations for magazines like that, you know, even, or uh, fantasy. Uh, uh, magazines, Frank Rosetta, William Snow, uh, Jack Davis. I was interested in their art first in kind of a comedic way, and then I would notice their art pop up in movie posters. So that would kind of made me go into the into the movie 
poster collecting world. I wasn't as interested in the movies so much, but the art really drew me in. And what some of the other artists were saying here, that the, um, the illustrations could capture more life and, and energy and excitement around an image than photography ever could for me. It was just some sort of visceral reaction I had. I had to, I had to look at it and I had to do it myself. So that, that was my lifelong journey and I, I can't stop doing it now. So there's no hope for me getting a regular job. What, what I think is, is so amazing about film posters, I'm sure you guys will agree, is a great, beautiful, painted film poster can, can really uh, be like a focus for your love of that movie without having to watch the movie from start to finish. Like, I have more love, I, although I love Back to the Future, the Back to the Future poster means more to me because I've seen it for longer. Yeah. Like, I had, uh, I know you did Labyrinth, and I had the Labyrinth poster hanging in my bedroom my entire childhood. So, that the poster itself means more sometimes than sitting through the actual movie. It's a, it's, it, it really is a nice, uh, beautiful way to focus your love for something. Yeah, you know? the challenge of doing a movie poster is creating a single image that encapsulates the feeling of the entire film and gets people excited and wanting them to see it. Yeah, like Life of Brian for you, when, when, when you worked on Life of Brian, uh, were you around when they were screening the film? Like, how did that go down? Did you get to see it early? Yeah, usually uh, they would screen the films for me if it was a major studio, Life of Brian. I also did uh, comps for Meaning of Life, and that was interesting, because the first thing they did is they sent me the screenplay. They said, Bill, we got a new Monty Python movie for you, it's Meaning of Life. So I read the screenplay, and as I was reading it, I could hear the Python's voices speaking those lines of dialogue, and I was just laughing. It was one of the funniest things I've ever read. Then they called and they said, okay, Wednesday, be at Universal Studios, we're gonna have a screening of the rough cut of the film. Uh, and so I said, oh, great. So I showed up, I was there, uh, Tony Seiniger was there, he was the head of the ad agency that was hiring me to do posters. Uh, and all the Universal brass were there, and they screened the film, and when the lights went on, it was dead silence because there was not one laugh in the entire movie. <laughs> and the Universal executives are going, how are we going to sell a comedy that's not funny? <laughs> oh my God. Well, what that taught me was the difference between a rough cut and a final cut. With the final cut, just one or two frames missing or added, can mean the difference between getting a laugh and not getting a laugh. So of course, when they did the final cut, it was a hilarious film. One of the things that got cut from the film was one of my favorite bits, though. In the very beginning of the film, John Cleese comes out and he says, ladies and gentlemen, uh, those of you with a more sensitive nature, we are going to warn you that this film contains full frontal male nudity. <laughs> you will be warned just prior to the full frontal male nudity. So the film starts in about every 20 minutes. Cleese comes on. Remember, this film has full frontal male nudity. <laughs> And the picture plays out, and the credits roll, and then at the very end of the credits, suddenly the entire screen lights up. Full frontal male nudity, warning, warning, warning. And it cuts to the six guys in Monty Python, completely naked, standing in a field with four foot long penises. <laughs> That's so amazing. Um, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, here's uh, here's a, a question for you. Um, how important, and, and anyone, feel free to answer this. How important do you think it is uh, to have beauty in advertising, in, especially in the world right now? It's such a digital world with you know people making everything in Photoshop and all this kind of stuff. Like, how do you feel about? Uh, the the uh, you know continuing this tradition about doing this, yeah. I, it's crucial. I think we uh, owe it. I think we owe it to uh, everybody out there. I mean, I feel like not so wax philosophical, but today more so than ever, we're sort of under a a visual assault of marketing everywhere we go. You can't escape it. It's inescapable. And more often than not, what you're seeing is manufactured corporate garbage selling you stuff you don't need, you know? Um, but one of our few remaining great exports is film. Everybody loves a good story. Um, and I think that 
if we're fortunate enough, we can make something beautiful to market that film with that enhances the experience of the film. It's not simply meant to stab you in the eyeballs and get your dollars from you. You know, like, I mean, I see a lot of faces out here that are probably my age, that if I say, close your eyes right now and imagine the poster in a never-ending story, you could probably describe it to me in full detail. You know what I mean? Like, that's just as much, you know, the poster to, to, to E.T., Amblin's E.T. You know, I mean, it's, it's part of the zeitgeist. You know, it, it, you know, like you said, sometimes the poster has more value even than the film over time. Yeah. You know, so that's where we're able to come in in, in this sea of visual garbage and try and make, like, a perfect little flower, you know, in that, if we're lucky. You know, if we hit it on the head. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Yeah, and, and for something like... Um yeah, like uh, like Infinity War, like for uh, for Paul down down there at the end. When you when you worked on something like that, like we saw that poster way before the movie came out, and we had all this time to put all these expectations into every single inch of that poster. And and you you know you put so you put, as a fan you put so much into it that what's so cool about posters like that and I always love when there's like many many characters and it's all like in like the Deadpool 2 poster where it's just there's lots of things happening all around and every time you look at it you see something different um, when it when it comes to to posters uh, is there a hidden is there some hidden stuff that each of you have hidden into some of these posters I know you guys have so. Uh, <laughs> You want to, could you guys talk about some of the hidden things that you've thrown into some of your work? I can neither confirm nor deny that <laughs> express permission is very offensive. I'd be interested in if there's anything hidden in that Rock and Roll High School poster that we should look out for. Oh man, and loads of stuff. Uh, you know, just as actors get typecast, so do movie poster guys, and, and I got uh, known for teen comedies. Right. I, uh, one of the teen comedy posters I did was uh, Hollywood Nights. Now, at that time, there were, there were no stars in that. They were all unknowns. Uh, but they sent me a stack of photographs of the actors, and there's this blonde. It's like, oh my God, this is the most stunning, really beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. I'm gonna place her prominently on this poster. And it, uh, oh God, it turned out to be Michelle Pfeiffer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was her, her first film. But uh, people don't remember it for Michelle Pfeiffer, they remember it for the guy who farted Villard. <laughs> Your punchline got a stick. D David, David got a little excited Rock about Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> High school poster and the Monty Python posters. I was really inspired by Jack Davis and Frank Rosetta, and I loved filling that with all kinds of gags and jokes. You know, the, the ad agency, agency didn't dictate any of that. It was up to me to s slip as many as what yeah. Harvey Kurtzman called eyeball kicks yes. in each poster. I love that. And it, it's so fun. I like creating art that's layered like that that you can go back to over and over again and see new things each time. Absolutely. Well, thank you. <laughs> For me, um, I don't know if it's necessarily like hiding little little uh, Easter eggs in there, but it's more about uh, coming back to the poster after you've seen the film and finding little clues that you may not have known before seeing the movie and, and seeing, oh, there's a concept behind that. Oh, I now get why that's there. And, and I like giving people the chance to revisit a poster and, and find something new. Yeah, especially in like the one I love poster that you did. Like you definitely see some. So there's some spooky stuff happening in that poster. <laughs> yeah, definitely, and and it's funny because uh, in that poster, the reflection um, of the man he's wearing glasses, and he's not wearing them um, obviously in real life. And someone actually called it out. And like, oh, I think you you accidentally painted the glasses. I'm like, how do you accidentally paint glasses? <laughs> so uh, it was a nice little nugget for people to, to find out after seeing the film that it actually had a uh, big meaning. Um, I, I got a question for uh, Robert Rodriguez. Yes. Uh, so Robert, when it comes to this, this poster, the Adventures of Robin Hood Errol Flynn poster, this is like, I've seen this poster so many times. It is such a classically beautiful piece of work. I had no idea Robert was around in the 30s. <laughs> I, I have a feeling, I've always had a feeling that MGM, uh, MGM, uh, that they actually thought that was the old poster. It, I thought it was the old poster, like, up till right now. 
Like, <laughs> up to... I thought you were gonna walk in and be 170 years old. I was like, how has he been doing this for so long? Well, um, that was, um... It was actually done for a doctor's convention. And they had this little box that they gave away to the doctors uh, with a, the arrow that goes through your head, you know, that you can wear. Um, and, uh, and, and the poster and a videotape of the old Robin Hood movie. And so that's who I did it for. And then it just wound up being used on everything. And, and I saw it on the side of MGM Studios about 20 feet tall, too. So at that point, I started thinking, they probably don't realize that this was a new poster. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have a question for you for the, for the whole panel, and I would love it if, if all of you guys could answer. Maybe start at Paul Shipper and come all the way down to me. Um, what or who inspired you to follow your path as an illustrator? Um, there's an obvious question there for most people who know my work, and it's probably, well, Drew Struzan was the main influence, but around the time I was collecting posters, I didn't realize who that was, age 12, like kind of like what James was saying. And uh, it wasn't until one day I looked at them and then realized that they were all painted by him, that the ones that are on my bedroom wall. So once I saw that, it was like, it's a bit of an epiphany to say, well, this is somebody's job. And you know, when you're a kid, you just think the movie posters are kind of materialize themselves. You don't really realize that all the people behind everything, you just think it's just comes part and parcel. You don't really know. So realizing that and realizing obviously how I was drawn to things like that and the work of uh, Richard Ansel and, and, and Bob Peake and you know, to me, they were always the three, the three big ones that I used to see a lot. And, um, and so they really influenced me in, in the way that I would study their work, I would get the posters from the local video shops and um, just grab my mum's magnifying glass and sit there in my bedroom floor just like looking at every detail and figuring out how this works because it's making me feel something and I don't understand it, it's just making me feel great and I don't get why. And I was just trying to kind of dissect it in a way and figure out how things were done and techniques and, and things like that. And so I was kind of excited. And at that time, there was no internet. So you just had to kind of fumble your way through to figure things out. And I knew I wanted to do something along those lines to make, try and make people feel the way I felt. So I'd do things for family and friends. And then, you know, you'd get feedback from them. And from there, it just kind of just kept blossoming and and now I'm, I feel so privileged to be among everyone on this panel just to be working on these posters and being able to try and keep them alive because um, it's something that's so important I think it's it's just something that I, I want everyone to try and feel the same way that you know we used to feel when we saw a movie poster the, the excitement the sense of the unknown the adventure you don't know what it's going to bring you but you're excited about it and you can just feel that in an instant just by looking at something at one image and that it becomes an indelible thing that lives alongside the movie hopefully for the rest of its lifetime and then you'll be able to carry that for the rest of your lifetime and that's something that i experienced growing up and i think it's something that should be um, heralded as a thing today um, and there are I mean, I mean, there's no question there are great posters and great, great um, campaigns out there but in a lot of ways it, it, nowadays it's very saturated um, some campaigns will have 20 different posters for different demographics and I think you know you could do a good job with one, two or three posters to sell a movie that have something incredibly special that, um, that are translated across every country that don't need to worry so much about demographics because everyone, every human being has this feeling of, we all feel the same way, we all have the same, we want love, we want to be loved, we, we have our own insecurities and all of that can be washed away or brought to you in a movie poster because I know that because I felt it when I was growing up and I still do today. So. 
I don't even know if I answered that question, but <laughs> went on a bit of a rant. That's great. <laughs> Um, I guess uh, if I think back to what got me into art in general is that I was terribly shy as a kid, I still am now, and it was my only way of communicating and making friends. And um, I think just growing up, uh, I was highly influenced by James Bond posters. Um, I loved Mad Magazine like crazy. And I think those were examples of me seeing that people could actually uh, draw for a living. So um, I just happened to follow that route. I, mean, I went to school for illustration. Um, I graduated and then I was doing editorial illustration for a few years in New York. And then when I fell into movie posters, it kind of felt like easy transition because editorial illustration, you're taking an article and trying to capture somebody's attention in one image. So it wasn't as far of a departure as I thought it would be. And um, you know, to this day, I'm still so thankful that I get to do this, and I keep my lights on doing it, and I'm happy that people appreciate it and want it, and um, yeah, I can't complain, so thank you. <clears throat> um, again, I, I already credited Drew with being a massive influence, as Paul says. Um, I think there was also the fact that one was seeing so many different artists at, at the same time, um, and with Akiko saying about the Bond posters that were so just incredibly powerful. They were like th these extraordinary compositions. Everything seemed to work. You had a mixture of sizes which somehow seemed to work. Um, it, it was almost a world unto itself. And um, I think you had the sense that all of these artists whose work you were seeing, whether it was John Alvin, Drew, Bob P, Frank McCarthy, um, David Grove, who were all being approached to do these jobs, each of them bringing something specific and different, which was the reason you would go to different artists. Say, so, well, I wonder what John Alvin's take on this would be versus Drew's take. So you had those two working in, you know, separately but simultaneously on these projects because each artist brought something different. And I think it maybe it would be fair to say that some of that has been lost today with the way that things are done, that there isn't so much personality. And again, just speaking for myself, very often it's that the studios will come to you knowing, in a sense, exactly what they want and asking for you to, in their parlance, do your magic. Um, but I said to somebody the other day, that's rather like somebody bringing you, you know, their dead magician's assistant saying, I've cut her in half, now do your magic and put her back together. And it's like, oh, okay, I can do that. So it, it, it's a strange sense where um, I think the reasons that they used to go to illustrators was because they were interested in the individual take that those people would have, which again, as a teenager or whatever age, growing up, maturing, you're seeing this, you're seeing what technique, what different approaches bring, and you're absorbing some of that and seeing the, the nature of the posters springing from that material <coughs> as opposed to being something that is, okay, this is what we're going to enforce on this. No matter what the subject matter is, we're going to plaster this on it, you know, regardless. Whereas what you see in older posters is not interchangeable, is not cookie cutter. Um, and I think that was one of the things that, whether I was conscious of it at the time, it's something that you observe and remember. Um, I guess for myself, uh, not speaking particularly about movie posters, but to become an illustrator, uh, I remember I was a sophomore in art school, and at that point you had a critique, and uh, they would look at your work and tell you if you could continue, if uh, you know, give you any recommendations. And I said I was thinking I might switch to fine art. Uh, and the teacher said, uh, imagine yourself in 10 years and you're still doing your painting in your studio every day, but 
you haven't sold anything in a while and so of course you have to have a day job and you come in at night and work and you work on weekends would you do that I said no I go to the beach <laughs> I, <could. laughs> I wanted I wanted my art to be my job because I really loved it but I really knew that I wasn't going to stick to it if I if I wasn't working you know making a living on it so uh, that's what I did. I stayed with illustration, and and uh, and I was always glad I did. Actually, um, it was very exciting. Um, always doing something different, um, and movie posters is one of those things. But I've always done everything. I structured the first part of my career after Frank Rosetta. Frank Rosetta did movie posters, so I did movie posters. He did comics, so I did comics. He worked on Little Annie Fanny, so I worked on Little Annie Fanny. He did album covers, I did album covers. And then uh, Robert Crumb became a huge influence. Uh, he showed me that in comics you could do anything. There were no limits. And that, that was profound. And then my friend uh, Jean Giraud, Mobius, he came to me and said, you have now mastered your work as an artist. Now, the next step is everything you do from now on should benefit the world, should make the world a better place. And I stopped taking jobs that didn't do that. And then I uh, worked for Harvey Kurtzman, Willie Elder, and Little Annie Fanny. I learned an enormous amount from Kurtzman. And one of my first jobs while I was still in art school was assisting and apprenticing under Russ Manning, who was doing the Tarzan of the Apes Sunday and Daily comic strips. And we did three graphic novels together as well. I learned an enormous amount about art and being a professional from working with Russ. And more important than that, I learned how to be a good father. Um, yeah, I think the original question, yeah, uh, who, 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 yeah. Who is uh, sure. It's, um, I mean, I've been uh, uh, drawing since I was a little boy, and I'm sure here would say the same thing they've been drawing since childhood and, and a lot of kids stop eventually and they go off and join football teams and get day jobs so we just keep drawing um, and I could name you know a million artists that have, have influenced me and inspired me and you know and, and there have been a lot and uh, but I never really took the idea of a career in art very seriously uh, as a younger man and um, and frankly all those people that inspire me you know aren't there at one in the morning when you're burning the midnight oil, trying to meet a deadline, and you're pulling your hair out, and you're, you know, coming apart at the seams. Yeah. Um, but my wife is. She's there. And she was the one who, who initially got me moving on this path early on in life, and, and mentioned to me that, you know, you draw really well, and other people draw well, and they make a living at it. And I'm like, I can't do that. You know, that's good artists do that. You know, pick, artists who go to art school and know people who know people, you know, but she just kept pushing. And, uh, and even today, she's my second pair of eyes on everything. And yeah, so I mean, if I had to just pick one person that influenced my journey the most, it's Vanessa. Mm -hmm. One day. <laughs> what do you got, Jason? Um, <laughs> Garfield comments? <laughs> uh, I don't. I, I planned my entire life by never having a backup plan. So I was four, I was a chubby kid, I did not sports. My dad could draw, and I learned that I could draw and I could copy Garfield out of memory and other kids, you know, would uh, befriend me because I could draw. So that became my superpower. So I never had a backup plan. I always knew I wanted to become an artist for a living, whatever that meant, I would, um, do whatever I had to do. I had, you know, had three jobs at one point, uh, just trying to have one of them be an art career. And then I was able to quit the other jobs and just do this full time. And, and some would say I make a living at it. Um, but as far as becoming, uh, influencing me and my style and the, the look of, of my career, I would have to say that uh, Greg and Tim Hildebrand would be the biggest influences among, you know, obviously Frank Frazetta and, 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 and Drew Struzan a little bit, but but the Hildebrand brothers, if you look at how they paint, uh, their color palettes, their, their lighting, um, just their philosophy about art and their properties that they work on, um, their aesthetic choices, that's the biggest influence for me. And art was never really about the subject matter, but about how that, um, 
subject matter was portrayed. So I was always style based, you know, um, a very aesthetic based, you know, what's the, what does the end product look like? So I could really illustrate anything given, um, given a subject matter as a, as a career, that if people would pay me, it's just, it would look the same way. So if you, you know, you want some nice pretty tomatoes, they'd look like I painted them, but they'd be, you know, I'd love that just as much as drawing, you know, uh, Kurt Russell. <laughs> I would just have as much fun as long as you could get paid as much painting tomatoes as you could Kurt Russell, but. <laughs> My story would echo pretty much everybody else's feelings. I mean, we all have a great number of artists to be able to look at and be influenced by. At the top of my list would be my father. And then because he was an artist, trained as an illustrator in Toronto, I moved out here from New York when, after I married, and so uh, pursued that kind of career. I never did go to college, so I was fortunate to get a job in animation. That way it put me in touch with all kinds of artists that were brought in freelance to do other things, William Stout, uh, for one. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez was an early uh, influence on me. At the same time, I met Drew. Drew was in college, and so we kind of worked our way up. I got to work with him for a while and early in his career, and the first movie posters that he did, and what an influence that was on me. Everybody here uh, echoes the same thing. In fact, if you remember seeing the image of the uh, Star Wars poster that Drew had done along with Charles White. Uh, the couple that he used as body doubles was myself and my wife. So we were we were going back that far. So. We have time for a few questions. So if you have a question, uh, hop over to that mic and uh, make it a good one. Hi. Yep. First of all, I just want to say thank you for what you do. Um, Awesome and keep going. Um, but I have just a general question for anyone who wants to answer. I'd just be interested in uh, if there's any property that you have not yet had a chance to paint. Um, like, what would you choose if you could choose like one thing? That's a great question because uh, the company Mondo provides us with that opportunity. Uh, Mondo has top contemporary illustrators do brand new movie posters for old classic films. And so it, it's given me a chance to do posters for films I never, you know, I wasn't even around when yeah. they were made. And so it, it's extraordinary time. Batman. <laughs> all day. I did my first one alternate poster after being pressured to do it, and I chose Bullet with Steve McQueen. Woo. Yeah, nice. So, hi. Oh, what? Oh. Are we all good? You guys all good? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, I just had a quick question just about the balance between kind of your artistic control and also the studios and kind of the back and forth of like, make this bigger, make that smaller, like all that kind of thing. How do you kind of handle that? How do you kind of convince them to be like, I promise this is the best one, like that kind of stuff. That's a great question. You know what's such a good question? I have a Blick Art Supply 20% off coupon for you. Same thing with the first question. So when you ask your question, then come over, I'll give it to you. Yeah, that's always been a problem. Many artists quit out of the business because there was so much pressure to make changes, and often overnight. So we had to work, figure out shortcuts in order to make those kind of changes, because after all, they pay the bill, we have to please them. Sometimes contractual. That head has to be bigger, because the title of his name is bigger too. So there are a lot of considerations that you don't think about with movie posters. And when those are hurdles that we have to learn to overcome. Yeah, typically, oh, go ahead. Um, that's half a job is trying to deal with a client, unfortunately. I think from anybody outside that sees a poster, it's very easy for them to critique it, but they have no idea what we have to go through behind the scenes with, you know, sometimes designed by committee or focus groups making creative calls. So if we can get something somewhat decent out there, it's like a huge achievement. Yeah, typically when I was working for Seidegger & Associates, I, I do a couple dozen roughs. And I'd do some black and white comps, I'd do color comps, and by the time I got to the poster, I'd run it about 40 times. But now you're doing the finish, that's the one the public is going to see. You've got to get all your juices up and ready and put it into that poster. It's really difficult. But that's why I like working for Roger Corman. Roger Corman didn't want to pay for all those roughs. 
So I could I could do a sketch in my sketchbook and say, what do you think of this for a rock and roll high school poster? And he'd say, go to finish. So <laughs> <laughs> all the energy would go into that poster. The, the other thing he said about the rock and roll high school poster, he said, Bill, you can do anything you want as long as it looks like Animal House. <laughs> I have a, a story about that was a shocker to me um, when I was doing uh, uh, Jewel of the Nile. I, they hired me to do a standee for that originally, and uh, we went. The art director and I went over to uh, I guess it was 20th Century. I guess. Paramount, I forget. But um, anyway, we went over and there's this big meeting room and there were all these people sitting in there and nobody was talking. And my poster was at one end with lights on it and everything. It looked beautiful. My, my standing. Um, and uh, nobody said anything and, and I'm just wondering what to do. And then the doors swing open and this guy who was obviously in charge, I don't know who he was, but he was the boss. He comes striding in with about five guys behind him, and he walks in, and he stands there, and he's looking at it. And uh, he goes, what do you think? Nobody said anything. He goes, well, I think it looks good, but I think they should be a little bit smaller, or a little bit bigger, whatever he wanted. He, he said, three guys jumped up from all over the place and came running up to the poster. That's exactly what I thought. <laughs> And when we left, I said to the art director, I said, I don't know if I can deal with it. This is crazy. You know? um, she said, no, no. Movie posters, different than advertising, different from what you do. She said, um, every time they say we'd like a change, you say, smile and say, of course we can do that. No problem. That's just another $500 or another $1,000 or something. In the end, a $10,000 job wound up being a $39,000 job. So I thought it was good advice. <laughs> All right, this is our last question. Uh, well, I'll ask the question. I have an example first. Uh, Akiko, the uh, poster you did for Last Black Man in San Francisco is like one of my favorite posters Thank ever. Thank you. Uh, but I wanted to use it. And just like Jimmy and the, the friend, I forget his name, just standing there. And it seems so simple, but it, it strikes me as something that, like, you look at the design of it and the illustration, and it uh, just seems like you had the idea instantly. Like, I know sometimes when I'm writing stuff that some of my best ideas are, you know, you have an emotional connection, it just immediately comes to you. So I'm just going to see, like, this is for everyone. Uh, what are like some of the uh, movies that you've done posters for that the idea just immediately comes to you? You're like, this is it, let's do it. And I'm sure some of those end up on the cutting room floor. But <laughs> I mean, um, the the last man, the last black man in San Francisco, the one where he's going uphill and it looks like he's leaning. That was one of my first ideas. Nice. And I was really happy that uh, both the director and A24 went for it, because I was, for some reason, I just loved how simple it was. It was also somewhat surreal, and it, I felt it was the right tone for the film, too, because it has surreal moments. So I was really excited when that one just went straight through. So, thank you. Yeah, well, a couple of stories like that. One of my early posters was for a Tom Selleck movie called Lassiter. And I worked really hard to make the idea work. It was my idea. I took it in. They all liked it very much. They saw it, thought, we like it so much, let's see what else he can do. So 22 ideas later, <laughs> they came back to the first one and they saved with that. <laughs> other situations have developed. I'm sure the others have had this happen too. Working for over a month on a Disney film with Eddie Murphy, it was a distinguished gentleman. We came up with sketch after sketch, they finally approved that, then we did color sketches, and then we went to finish, brought the finish in, the deadline was almost done, really was done, and the art director said, we, we don't even want to see it, because Jeffrey Katzenberg came in, he had a dream last night, he wants us to do this. <laughs> so, and it had to be done in one day. So the movie poster that was used, whether he's reaching into the Capitol building like it's a cookie jar, bringing out dollars. We did that in a 24-hour period because Jeffrey Katzenberg had a dream. <laughs> wow. Um, 
Some of my alternative posters uh, uh, have come to me like that. Um, the graduate that I did uh, uh, came that way where I just sat down and it just kind of all came out at once. And, um, and some posters have come out of when it, it's harder with the, uh, the official key art posters because the studios, you know, as I mentioned before, they come with their own set of uh, ideas and concepts and directions that they want you to go down. The alternative posters allow you the freedom to sort of come at it with your own fresh approach right out of the gate. So um, I'd say Annihilation was another poster I did where I left the theater with that poster in my head. Yeah. Um, Ex Machina, during the middle of the film, I saw a frame on screen and I was like, that would look beautiful hanging in my living room. I want that on my wall. <laughs> you know, like, so some of those, you know, come, come out that quickly. Yeah. Uh, oh, we, uh, oh. guys, we have to, we have to uh, end this uh, amazing panel, but uh, quickly, as we end, if everybody, if you have uh, a social media, I know everybody's uh, websites are in the book, but if you have a social media link you want to tell this room, they will, uh, then they will all follow you. Isn't that right, everyone? Uh, so uh, if you have a Twitter handle, Instagram, just uh, shout it out. I'll start by saying my uh, website is with Flash, and they're cutting it out, so i got to make a new one. <laughs> I put my stuff on Facebook. That's great. Um, Instagram's the easiest, just Jason Edmiston Art. Easy. Oh, uh, RoryKurtz.com. <laughs> yeah, uh, Williams.com, I'm also on Facebook. And I'm at booth 4803 downstairs. Uh, Akikomatic.com. And on my Instagram, I just joined uh, Instagram about a year ago. It's Joy Derivative, like Joy and Derivative mixed together. Mine is just James Goodridge Illustration at Instagram. I guess mine would be www dot fine art prints ca dot com <laughs> or just do a google search you'll find it although you might get mixed up with the director in there as well um, my social media is usually at paul shipper or at paul shipper art and you'll find me on twitter and instagram paul shipper studio on facebook and uh, if you guys, if you get a chance to, uh, go and subscribe to the Nighttime Show podcast. Recent guests include uh, The Office Reunion, Tiffany Haddish, Ed Asner, Tom Green, the cast of Kids in the Hall, uh, the Starship Troopers 30th Anniversary Reunion, and so many other uh, amazing people. Thank you so much for coming out. Give these guys a round of applause.